Uh, as, a, as like an immigrant, a Muslim, fairly liberal person, I think this is probably the best event that I've uh, been able to access just because I'm not sitting in the audience and nodding for an hour. <laughs> well, thank um, you. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I, I really do uh, appreciate the, the platform for free dialogue. I think it's extremely important uh, for there to be free speech so the good ideas sort of crowd out the bad ones. Um, the reason I'm, I'm kind of here today is because well, you know while I was sitting there, and, I, and I've noticed this in a lot of your your videos, which I, I do spend some time watching. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. Definitely entertaining, yeah. So, um, so like you know, like yeah, like yesterday, right before coming here, um, or before I slept, I watched you on Piers Morgan talking about gun control. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I heard you for an hour today, and I think what I realized is it's I think the first step is talking about free speech, and I think the left can definitely work on that. Uh, the second step is is using solid uh, sound. Uh, I guess, evidence for your speech so mm -hmm. that truly you have good ideas crowding out the bad. And I just wanted to take issue with a few things that you mentioned uh, that I felt were a bit more sensational, uh, a bit more, I guess, I, I know you're from like a, a lawyer background, so I, I can see. No, go for uh, it. I'm, I'm yeah, so like you mentioned for uh, rape on college campuses from 1995 to 2002 was a statistic you used. I because those are the last available statistics from the Sure, BJS. sure. So, so yeah. there's current statistics that you think um, have I guess methods that are you know, unjustified because it's self-identified, uh, but that's contemporary. And you're looking at something that started uh, 20, 20 years ago um, and then making up for the caveat that, okay, it's, it's uh, self-identified, so it, it might not actually reach time out. So what I'm saying is so clearly we don't have sound data on this um, and, and maybe not all of the self-identified reports are justified, but using a statistic that's 20 years old, even if it's the most contemporary one that you have, is I think unsound in terms of academic... So I agree with you. I'd like to have better statistics. Now let me ask you a question on that. Do you think that the rape rate in the United States on college campuses is closer to 6 in 1,000 or 250 in 1,000? I, I definitely think it's somewhere in between, and I don't think I have... No, but I mean, like, if you, had to, if you had to try and peg a number. I mean, I, I understand that I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to iterate. I'm not, a, like, a scientist or a statistician, and I don't claim to, or posture to be, and I don't think you should either. If you don't have statistics... Do you, you think can't. that it has increased 10,000%? No, 10, what I'm saying is for you to criticize a certain community of using a statistic, one out of five, as sensational or ridiculous... Because the people who actually created that statistic you. say that it's being misused. Sure, and you're using a statistic that's 20 years old, because it's the best statistic available. Again, if you're willing to give me better statistics, I am more than willing to hear them. No, and as fair. I've said, if you provide me new evidence, I'm more than willing to change right, my mind. Fair, yeah. No, I, I mean, I don't think I have the political knowledge to, to, to debate that. So like, just, I, just a couple things. So moving forward, I think you talked about, um, I don't know, you said, like, you mentioned Jim Crow laws and, and slavery for what kind of pushed uh, black people back. And you said, okay, th this is in the past. Again, this is an example of taking the, the opposition's argument, making a character of it, and dropping it down real fast. Everyone knows about Jim Crow, everyone knows about slavery. Not as many people know about, for example, redlining in, the Chicago, in Chicago in, in, in the 1960s that the CBL had to push out by 1964. The, these kinds of systems have been entrenched for years. I think uh, most people have read uh, ta Coates' Coates' article on, on how this has developed a, a you know, system of entrenchment for these communities. Even today, uh, under Rahm Emanuel, who's a Democrat and I think is wrong, um, implements TIP increment financing that takes money out of Western and, and Southern uh, Chicago and, and reappropriates them to places that don't really need it as much. Clearly there's a lack of funding. He closed 47 schools over the past years. What I'm basically trying to say is there's a lot of factors going on in these communities that are predominantly black, Hispanic, et cetera. And for you to simply say that, okay, Jim Crow happened 50 years ago, racism hasn't increased, is, is a bit, I, I think, again, insincere because I don't believe that racism has, I do believe that racism has decreased and you know, yeah, we're, we're saying the N-word less, sure. But but I don't think that racism at a systemic level has decreased because the same communities that were affected in the 1960s, you know, those people are still alive. That's a, that's a wild accusation. I mean, like, I'm, I'm with you all the way up till the end. When, okay. when, when you say there's a lot of complexity to these arguments, I agree there's a lot sure, of complexity sure. to these arguments. Yeah, I'll okay. tell you where there's no complexity, and that is the only way you are going to get out of the current problems that you are in is by relying on yourself to make good decisions. That's not to say that there aren't obstacles, and if there are obstacles that you can name, I'm more than happy to stand there and fight them with you. If you can show me evidence of redlining by a bank in which a black person and a white person are being treated unequally with exactly the same application, I will stand next to you and root for them to be prosecuted in court because that's illegal under the Civil Rights Act. But if you're going to suggest that racism has not decreased over the last 50 years, it's just sort of hidden, there is no evidence to suggest that whatsoever. Sorry, I, I might have misspoke. So I, yeah, I agree with you. That, that was uh, my bad. I don't think racism has increased. It's absolutely decreased. But I think that the institutions that existed 50 years ago haven't really vanished. The, the title character of, of the Atlantic story, Clyde Ross, I went to his house. You know, he is experiencing the same things that he experienced 50 years ago. Um, the government will come by. And I know you say that the government shouldn't fix this. And I agree. I'm just saying the government shouldn't make it worse. The government comes by. They say, hey, we're providing subsidies for these communities to become better. You can use it for paint for your house, uh, better windows, anything that 
the, the, like the public can see to make it look better. But he doesn't have ho a heating in his house. But he can't use it for that because that's just not the system that's in place. Right. All I'm saying is the that government sucks. Yeah. But I, I totally agree with you on that. But I, <laughs> so uh, all I'm trying to say so is so come that, to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess all I'm trying to say is um, I, I definitely agree that these are complicated. I think the left and the right they take small points and they sensationalize them to create a political platform. I would just appreciate it since you are a journalist and not a politician to do the same kind of you know, due diligence when you really like offer input because a lot of people listen to you, a lot of people respect your. Well, okay, so so again, the, the article that you're citing by Tan Hesey Coates, I haven't actually read that article, so I'm not going to claim knowledge of an article that you've read and I haven't. So I'll take your account of the situation for what it is, which is there's some guy who is apparently being victimized by the government because the government will only give him subsidies for X, Y, and Z, but he actually wants it for A, B, and C. My answer to that is that it's not the government's job to provide subsidies for anyone. And if the, if the government is mal-appropriating subsidies, I, I object to that regardless of the race of the person. Like I object to subsidies to the ethanol boondoggle in Iowa, which is basically white people. And I object to subsidies to Wall Street. I object to all these subsidies. I don't think the government should be involved at all. And this fellow who you know, was victim, to, to pretend that, that systematized discrimination under Jim Crow that was happening in 1960 is the same as a badly run government program in 2017 because they want to give you money for your windows but not for your water heater. Again, I don't see the relationship between the two. And to suggest that the banks are operating in the same way now as they were operating in 1960, I don't see the evidence for that either. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to look at evidence, but I need actual evidence. I, I can't just base it on headlines. At another university, a warning from the administration. Students at UC Berkeley are being told that anyone who violently protests a speech by conservative writer Ben Shapiro will be confronted by police. A large section of the campus is closed off, including the very plaza where the free speech movement began in the 1960s. There's enhanced security, and police can now use pepper spray on protesters after a 20-year-long ban on the spray was lifted by the city council this week. Shapiro's appearance is a key test for Berkeley, which has been hit by a series of violent clashes between a far-left and far-right agitators. Well, meanwhile, several faculty members at the University of California, Berkeley, are calling for a boycott during Free Speech Week in what they say is an effort to keep their students, quote, physically and mentally safe from speakers like Milo Yiannopoulos. Now, the boycott letter demands that during free speech week, which starts September 25th, classes be canceled and buildings be closed off, allowing students and staff to stay home. Yiannopoulos and a former White House chief strategist, Steve Bannon, are set to give speeches during free speech week uh, to discuss all of this. Let's bring in Milo Yiannopoulos, a political commentator and author of the book Dangerous. Milo, good to have you with us. And Milo, you're promoting Thank free. You. Good to have you with us, Milo. You're promoting free speech. Uh, some faculty members calling for a boycott. What's your reaction? Well, it sort of demonstrates my point, the point that I write about in the book, and the whole reason to do Free Speech Week in the first place. My contention is that American higher education has moved away from its original mission of challenging and broadening young minds, and instead become a sort of therapy session, a therapy session for the professors and for the students too. It's become somewhere that people go to be insulated from new ideas instead of to be exposed to them. So Free Speech Week will introduce a lot of conservative and libertarian superstars, big uh, um, and popular candidates campus speakers like Ann Coulter, who is a 12-time New York Times best-selling author, me, Steve Bannon, and a bunch of other people too, um, to expose Berkeley's students to points of view that their professors are not teaching them. They're getting a very um, restricted sort of education when they're not exposed to conservative or libertarian points of view. And we intend to bring uh, those points of view to campus to give students the education that they're, they're paying for but not receiving from Berkeley. And, uh, of course, uh, this has caused a lot of controversy. A few weeks ago, the mayor of Berkeley urged the university to cancel your appearance, saying he was afraid of the violence, that anti-fascists uh, will use large protests to create mayhem, that it's going to cost a lot of money to keep things secure. Many are echoing these concerns that there'll be clashes between your opponents and supporters. And that, of course, was the reason that your speaking engagement was canceled earlier this year. So, Milo, are we now in a place where we let the mere threat of violence from those that disagree with you and others now control freedom 
of expression. Are we nearing dangerous territory where the brute force of the loudest mob, if you will, defines when and whether Americans are free to express unpopular ideas? Is this where we're at now? Well, it's worse than even you suggest because it's not about being fr fr uh, free to, to express unpopular ideas. My ideas are very popular. Uh, most True. Americans agree with me about free speech and about free expression, the First and the Second Amendment. Most Americans are firmly in support of free expression, which is the whole point of Free Speech Week. It's actually worse than you suggest. It is a small uh, contingent of very influential and powerful, far left um, establishment types, the people who run universities, you know, the mayor, the mayor, by the way, who's friends with the by any means necessary group that violently shut down the event last time, and he uh, tweeted that I was a, uh, a white nationalist and had to retract it and apologize um, after egging on protesters basically to smash the town up last time. He suddenly realized after half a million dollars worth of damage was done to Berkeley, maybe it wasn't such a good idea for him to be encouraging them with lies after all. Um, you know, now and now, the, the, the Kafka-esque situation we find ourselves in is that the left is punishing me for, for a problem they created themselves. Berkeley's trying to charge me tens of thousands of dollars in security fees so that my uh, audience and my speakers are safe from violence that Berkeley itself has nurtured and encouraged. You see, Berkeley leaked my speaker list. They leaked the fact that uh, Steve Bannon and Coulter and I would all be speaking during Berkeley Free Speech Week. The only possible explanation, the only reason, reason reasonable uh, thing you can come to. The only way this makes sense is that they were trying to give a heads up to domestic terrorists mm. to increase the re resistance to this event, to drum up opposition, and to give uh, Antifa and the Black Bloc protesters who violently shut down the speech of conservatives and libertarians a heads up. UC Berkeley are in cahoots with these people. Um, well, unfortunately, that runs afoul of their First Amendment commitments. They're not entitled to machinate against conservatives to ban their opinions from campus. And I, I don't have any particular any particularly outrageous points of view. My views are shared by millions of ordinary Americans. They're simply not views that are popular with pro college professors, let's say, and with uh, journalists. Well, um, tough, tough. <laughs> you know, well, you're going to have um, to get used to it, UC Berkeley. Well, you know, perhaps they published your list to give you more publicity. That, that, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But, you know, Milo, there's all this talk about the I mental... I think UC Berkeley has demonstrated they're not worth uh, the benefit of the doubt. Well, you know, you do hear all of this talk about the mental safety of students that could be traumatized by hearing you, that there's going to be counseling available ahead of your appearance and uh, ahead of the political commentator, Ben Shapiro. But before you laugh, I mean, is, is there a double standard here when counseling isn't offered on campuses ahead of liberal speakers? You had a Muslim-American activist, Linda Saussure, she's called for jihad against the Trump administration. Well, Do you think there's a double standard uh, not taking the sensitivities of conservative students? equally. I don't think conservatives get themselves in a tizzy just because somebody who disagrees with, the, with them is speaking. I don't need counseling after I, I hear Linda Sarsour speak. I just need a bucket. Um, you know, conservatives are generally a lot more resistant to different ideas and they tend to embrace being challenged. Well, the problem is that these, as I said at the beginning, beginning of, the, of the segment, these places have become therapy culture. There's somewhere you go to run away from new ideas instead of engaging with new ideas. And the, the particular brand of sort of far left social right. justice um, leftism that is being taught um, at these schools, which inv involves a variety of conspiracy theories about uh, the patriarchy, about white supremacy, all this kind of stuff, that they, they, these, these uh, moral panics, like acid rain and satanic child abuse, it's a moral panic, you know. Um, this stuff that is drummed up, inculcated in these kids, they, the kids are probably scared to death. It's not the students that I blame. I don't blame a young 20 or 21 year old who's at UC Berkeley, who has been told by his professors that the biggest threat to his, uh, to his safety is, you know, the, uh, these scary conservative speakers. I blame the professors and I blame the administrators. And if UC Berkeley will not uh, okay. meet its First Amendment obligations, then it has to be, uh, it has to have its federal funding withdrawn. And if, right. uh, if Free Speech Week does not proceed and the four days of Free Speech Week are not successfully executed, I will be launching a national campaign to have the entire UC system um, denied federal funds.